please take a moment right now to hit like, subscribe, and share. Especially share. That's the big one. Hello film historians, I'm Derek and I love old movies. We've got Sam the sidekick here. Hello, and welcome to episode 56. And we're into October now, so that means many things. Many, many things. Mostly, it means that it's spooky season. Ooh. So some horror films are coming up for us. Definitely a horror film today, and in two weeks, maybe more of a monster mash kind of film. Totally. But that's not all. No. No. Of course, we just passed by Canadian Thanksgiving this weekend. Monday, in fact, was the day. But celebrations and observances and people getting together with people they love and doing the things they enjoy, that was going on all last weekend. It sure was for us. We were up to Barry's Bay to visit family, do the meal, the whole thing. What we didn't get to do on Sunday, of course, was enjoy one more ball game with the Blue Jays because of their literally historic collapse on Saturday, eliminating Canada's team from the Major League Baseball playoffs. We might be film fans here on the show, but we love our baseball too. And Saturday was a bitter pill to take. Ugh, and how. But what's the old saying? We'll get him next year. Yeah, true, true, but... Still, I think there will be a lot of soul searching after that loss. I mean, it's one thing to lose a game. That happens all the time. It's another to lose in a manner that has happened only three times in 109 years. But it was a fun season for the Jays. Just a tough, tough end. Well, only one team can win after all. So true. And then, of course, there is the other big thing. What's that? Well, today... Not as we record this, but like as it is released and people are listening to it, it is your birthday. Oh, yeah. 18, kid. How does that feel? You know, when we started this podcast, I was only 16. I do know that. It was literally in our tagline. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, 18 seems okay. I mean, I guess. I don't have much to base it on yet, but I am looking forward to voting in the municipal election exercise my democratic responsibility and all that. And two nights down at Toronto to see AEW. Dynamite and Rampage. Just fantastic. So, happy birthday, Sam. Hope your year ahead is great. And if you would like to give Sam a birthday shout-out, drop us a line in the comments, send an email, or hit her up on Instagram. At HorrorFlickChick. And before we get on with business, here is a special birthday tune for you from Alfalfa. Business number one, thanks for being here. Yep. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. We love watching these films and chatting about them for you. 
It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. And you know what else? We love hearing from you. So if you ever have like an idea or a thought or a suggestion for us, a film we could cover or a part of the film you'd like to hear us talk about, let us know. Also, if you'd like to read a cold open for the podcast, maybe talking about a nostalgic or formative experience you had watching movies, get in touch and let's make that happen right away. You don't even have to have come from a small town in the Ottawa Valley. But bonus points if you did. Always. And then if you're looking for something fun to do right now or maybe later on the weekend, why not check us out on the socials? Why not indeed? After all, we are on the Facebook. I love old movies. The podcast. The Instagram. At I love old movies. The podcast. El Twitter. At ILOM podcast. And the good old fashioned email. I love old movies. The podcast at gmail.com. All one word. And of course, you should also do what all the cool kids do. And you know what I'm going to say. That is pet the rock. And by this, we mean head on over to PetRockRadio.ca to listen to amazing local web-based radio programming. It's got fantastic music. It's got previous episodes of our show. It's got incredible hosts. And we are broadcast once, twice, thrice a week. Monday and Saturday and Sunday. Come for the music. Stay for the podcasts. We'll link that for you in the description. So, are you all set to match wits and supernatural power with the OG vampire badass Count Orlock? I got a pocket full of garlic and I'm sharpening my steaks. Hit the music! The director of Nosferatu is F.W. Murnau. After studying philology and art history at university, Murnau served in World War I, first as a company commander in the infantry, and then as a member of the Imperial German Flying Corps. He flew missions for two years, surviving eight plane crashes. Eventually, he landed in Switzerland inadvertently, where he was arrested and imprisoned for the rest of the war, and it was in this prison camp that he wrote his first script. After World War I ended, Murnau started his own film studio, working with Conrad Veidt, who listeners will remember played Cesar the Somnambulist in The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Murnau only directed 21 films, and of those, eight are considered lost, which leaves a very small body of work behind. Certainly, his most famous film was Nosferatu, which was an adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel Dracula. Now, Murnau was a highly stylistic director, exploring techniques like point-of-view shots and extensive camera movement long before such things were common. He worked in an expressionist style, but also shone a light on themes of social injustice. After making a large-budget adaptation of the story Faust, which was one of the first movies to feature an original score, Murnau in emigrated to America, where he worked in Hollywood. His first film there, Sunrise, is considered one of the greatest of all time and won several Academy Awards at the first ever ceremony, sharing Best Picture with Wings. Murnau's subsequent work was not as well received. He struggled incorporating sound with his films and preferred the medium of silence to tell his stories. He was, however, a director that had much more to give creatively, but we'll never know what that would have looked like, as Murnau died in a car crash in 1931 at the age of 42. Austrian-born Henrik Galin grew up in a Jewish family and moved to Germany in the early 1900s, where he became involved in the theater scene as an actor in Berlin. He first got his start in the film industry in 1913 as an uncredited screenwriter for several movies. The following year, he wrote and directed his first credited film, The Gollum, and he later got a job working at the major German film studio, UFA, after World War I. With the studio, Galeen worked on films such as Ruth's Two Husbands, 1919, and Waxworks, 1924. In 1922, Galeen was hired to work on the film originally titled Dracula, but he assumed it was copyrighted and renamed it Nosferatu. He is probably most known for his work on Nosferatu, as well as The Student of Prague, 1926, and Al Raun in 1928. Between 1928 and 1931, Galeen lived in Britain, where he worked on the movie After the Verdict in 1928, as well as several short films. After that, he moved back to Germany and worked on his final film, The House of Dora Green, in 1933, 
but he quickly left the country and eventually made his way to the United States as the Nazi party took power. Remembered as a successful and influential figure in early German Expressionist film, Galen died in 1949 at the age of 68. Playing the legendary and iconic role of Count Orlok, the first great screen vampire, is the amazingly named Max Schreck. Max Schreck was born in 1879 in Berlin and found his fascination with acting early. Although his father didn't approve of acting, Max's mother gave him money, which he secretly used for acting lessons. It wasn't until the death of his father that Max began appearing on stage, becoming a gem of German theater. With his striking features, acting ability, and fascination with the magic of makeup, a German Lon Chaney, if you will, Max became known for his very convincing portrayals of the grotesque, and often utilized all his skills in portraying characters far older than he actually was. Max first made a film in 1920, and had only been in five films before being cast in Nosferatu. With his eerily believable portrayal of Count Orlok, Max became an enduring legend, both in his homeland and internationally. Rumors ran unchecked that, about Max that still endure today, with the biggest and the most believed and most often related was that Max himself was not playing a vampire in Nosferatu, but indeed was a vampire. Long before CGI and modern makeup, Max succeeded in altering his appearance so drastically for the film that the rumors of his real vampirism continued to take hold. Now that his contemporaries spoke about him being a loner, living on the edges of reality, and enjoying long walks in the forest by himself, this did not help the rumors. Add in the fact that Schreck is the German word for terror, and the story surrounding Max continued far outside the bounds of Germany, there's even a film based on these rumors. Shadow of the Vampire came out in 2000, and it landed Willem Dafoe an Oscar nomination for his vampiric portrayal of the legendary Max Schreck. Max continued to work in German theater as well as film, surviving the transition to talkies, but despite the 47 film credits he managed to rack up between 1920 and 1936, his leading roles were mainly on stage. On the night of the 19th of February, 1936, Max had stepped into the role of the Grand Inquisitor in the play Don Carlos, standing in for another actor. After the show, Max was feeling unwell, and upon speaking to a doctor, he was sent to a hospital. He died there early the next morning of heart failure, at the age of 56. Gustav von Wagenheim, who plays Hutter, was born in 1895 to an incredibly prolific actor father and a less prolific, though no less theatrical, mother. It is unsurprising that Gustav followed in their footsteps, becoming a noted actor, film director, and screenwriter. His paternal ancestors were of German nobility, the Barons of Wagenheim. Although Gustav earned only 20 film acting credits between his screen debut in 1916 and his last in 1931, this does not begin to touch on his career. His screen acting is most remembered for his roles in 1922's Nosferatu, as well as 1929's Woman in the Moon by Fritz Lang, among one of the earliest depictions of space travel on film, and it remains known as one of the very first serious science fiction films. After those two films, however, Gustav is much more interesting for his politics than his career in film and stage. By 1921, Gustav had joined the Communist Party of Germany, and in 1931, he established a theatrical company that was composed exclusively of communists. Gustav managed to write and produce three plays by 1933, which is when his company was shut down by the Nazi party. Understandably, Gustav's ideology made him an ideal target for the Nazis' persecution, and he fled to the Soviet Union, becoming a long-term resident of the Hotel Lux, a bastion that housed exiles from 50 different countries. This same year that he arrived in the Soviet Union, Gustav became the new leader of the Left Column, a Soviet theatrical company made up of primarily German exiles. He managed to secure enough funding to direct the film Der Kampf in 1936, which was a film that protested directly and vehemently against the oppressive policies of Nazi Germany. Unfortunately, Gustav's very vocal political views earned him the attention of the ongoing trials of the Great Purge, which was a repressive political movement happening in the Soviet Union. According to testimony from Gustav's son, Gustav was forced to become a false witness against Trotskyite actors. In 1943, Gustav became a founding member of the National Committee for a Free Germany 
an anti-Nazi and pro-Soviet organization founded in the Soviet Union, primarily by German exiles and German prisoners of war. After the end of World War II, Gustav settled in East Berlin, where he joined the state-owned film studio, DEFA, serving as one of its main film directors and screenwriters until his death in 1975 at the age of 80. We are looking at an absolutely legendary film here, a critical touchstone in horror cinema, and as such, it is impossible to really do justice to the impact and lore around this film with the time we have. But... But there are two pretty interesting aspects of the production and the finished product that we will take a quick look at. The lawsuit against the film by the heirs of Bram Stoker, and the presumption of anti-Semitic undertones in the film. Let's hear it. So, as long as motion pictures have been a thing, there's been an insatiable thirst for content. Most specifically, great stories to bring to the screen. And make no mistake, Bram Stoker's novel Dracula was definitely considered one of the stories that needed this treatment. Well, of course. I know they made a play of it first, and it even starred Bela Lugosi, right? We are way before that. Let's go back to pre-World War I, when filmmakers wanted to get the rights to produce a version of Dracula for the screen, but Bram Stoker held firm in his wish to not have the novel filmed, so the rights were inaccessible. A bit short-sighted of him, but okay. It's his story. But then he died. And that brought filmmakers around again, now approaching Stoker's widow and heirs. But they held firm to Stoker's wishes as well. Drat. So the team behind the film that would become Nosferatu had an idea. Just film it anyway? Basically. Change the name from Dracula to Orlock, the name of the novel from Dracula to Nosferatu, change the setting from England to Germany, change any number of details, whatever they could. And also argue that the film was exclusively for German audiences. This was all a very elaborate way of trying to get the film made while ensuring that Bram Stoker's estate wouldn't be able to sue. Okay, that's pretty smart. A bit sneaky and unethical, but pretty smart. But the estate sued anyway, right? Oh, yeah. And won, right? Oh, yeah. Big time. Huge financial settlement? Well, this wasn't really about money. It was about the creation of a property that by rights should not be in existence. So the lawsuit penalty was less about dollars and cents, or Deutschmarks and Pfennigs, as much as it was about rounding up every last copy of the film in existence and destroying it. Wait, what? Yeah. Complete cancellation, a retroactive erasure of the entire film, Nosferatu, wiped from existence. But, but that didn't happen. We still have it. How? Well, it was the 1920s. Rounding up every copy in the world was always going to be difficult. There was always likely to be a few that slipped through the cracks. And as well, almost certainly, some copies were hidden. Eventually, the terms of the lawsuit lapsed, and I imagine the novel rights fell into public domain, and by then, historians were treating the film as a masterpiece, so when copies started turning up again, no one was worried about the lawsuit anymore. I mean, the Bela Lugosi version is good. Is great, even. Yeah, totally. He's Dracula. But Nosferatu, it's better, Mm -hmm. personally. To me, it's better. It's my favorite vampire film, and nothing else comes close. I can't imagine a world without it. I know. I love it. I really do. All of it. Every frame. Even the anti-Semitism? I beg your pardon? So, it's not an exaggeration to say that Germany is a nation with a troubled history regarding its treatment of its Jewish population. Even before the rise of the Nazis and the horrors perpetrated by them, anti-Semitic sentiment and representation was quite high. Enough so that it was assumed, with some evidence, that Nosferatu was a thinly disguised piece of anti-Jewish propaganda. I've missed something here. So, let's start with Orlok's appearance. Far from being a dashing and debonair, mysterious foreign nobleman exuding a certain je ne sais quoi, Shrek's Orlok has a far more rodent-like appearance. His fangs are not at the regular canine position, but at the front, like the gnawing teeth of a rat or a mouse and equating the Jewish population with rodents was a very common thing in anti-Semitic literature at the time. Ugh, so gross. It gets worse. When Orlok arrives in Wisborg, he is accompanied by an army of rats that is assumed spread a plague through the town. This was seen as a commentary on how Jewish people and culture were spreading through Germany, in a way that could be seen as very negative and possibly even fatal for German people and German culture. The equating of Jewish people with rodents and their culture as a plague was right there, in the imagery, 
for the people that wanted to see it. But was this legit? Was this a creative decision by the director? It's almost impossible to think that such a thing was actually the case. Murnau was known specifically to not be anti-Semitic, and in fact had many close friends and artistic collaborators who were Jewish, and he was also known as someone who's a bit of an artistic champion for the downtrodden. The idea that he made this as some sort of propaganda film belies belief. What's the tale of the tape on this one, Sam? Okay, so we have a 7.9 on IMDb. That's outrageous. The audience score is 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. What the heck, other 13? And the tomato meter is 97%. I can live with it. The film won no awards, but it can be watched on the Shutter or AMC's subscriptions on Amazon Prime Video. It's 1838, and in the small town of Wisborg, a real estate agent named Nock sends his employee Hutter to Transylvania to meet a mysterious client, Count Orlock. Orlock wants to relocate to Wisborg and is interested in purchasing an abandoned house across the street from Hutter's. While traveling, Hutter spends a night at a cozy inn, but once he mentions that he is off to see Orlock, everyone kind of freaks out and they tell him to stay inside because of a werewolf that patrols the forest. No, there's nothing ominous about a warning like that. A werewolf? Preposterous! The next day, Hutter arrives at Orlok's castle. Hutter is fed, but he cuts himself on a knife, and this leads to Orlok trying to suckle his blood. Hutter is a bit creeped out by that. Understandably. And when he wakes up the next morning, he finds two puncture wounds on his neck, which he assumes were made by mosquitoes. Who wouldn't assume that? Right. So when next they get together, Orlok signs all the purchase agreements. But as he does, he sees a photo of Hutter's wife and he comments that she has a lovely neck. Hutter soon begins to suspect that Orlok might be a vampire. He hides in his bedroom, and Orlok enters. And as Hutter passes out, his wife, back home, wakes up and in a trance, shouts for Hutter. Almost as if she knew what was happening. But Hutter's fine! Is he, though? Next, we see him skulking around the castle, even finding Orlok in his coffin. Which he does nothing about. No. Vampire confirmed. You've got him dead to rights. Stake him. Stake him. But no, Hutter does nothing. And Orlok loads his coffins up on a cart and then to a boat. And he sets sail for Wisborg. Killing everyone aboard the ship. Obviously. And when the ship arrives, Orlok takes one of the coffins and skulks through the town, spying on Hutter's wife before setting up shop in his new house. Somehow no one sees him, in spite of how suspicious and conspicuous he seems. Wisborg soon develops a death problem, and people assume there's a plague. Ellen learns that a vampire can be defeated by the beauty of a pure-hearted woman, so she sets a trap for Orlok. Orlok comes to her room and drinks her blood, but he loses track of time and is destroyed by the sunlight of daybreak. Hutter arrives with a doctor, but Ellen does not survive, having sacrificed herself to destroy the vampire. The end. Good old Nosferatu. I love that guy. <laughs> I know you do. Let's uh, let's prank on this thing. Let's do it. So as always, we don't actually rate films here on the show. There's no stars. There aren't even any thumbs. We just discuss some things we liked. And some we didn't. And then we make a recommendation as to whether or not you should give this one a watch. Take it away. My pros. Number one, the cinematography. There is some really nifty camera work in this film, and we are treated to a buffet of really clever and compelling shots. The exterior shots are incredible, showing spooky countrysides, but it's in the city, and aboard the boat, we really get the good stuff. The location shooting in the city, particularly the wide streets densely packed with buildings showing the parade of the lonely town crier, or the procession of the plague dead, or the angry mob chasing Nock, or Orlock skulking around carrying his coffin— the claustrophobic, heavily framed interiors, the looming shadows, the menace of Orlok as he approaches and moves around in his odd way. The cinematography in this film is incredible, and it really holds up. Number two, Max Schreck's performance as Count Orlok, perhaps the greatest of all screen vampires. There's a perfect storm of awesome going on in the pres- presentation and portrayal of this character. 
makeup, costume, expression, gait, prosthetic teeth, the amazing rat-like face, Shrek comes to life in this film and creates a legendary portrayal of the first great screen vampire. And to me, honestly, he is the template of what a vampire should be and is best as devoid of humanity hideous, asexual, and more easily misidentified as a plague and not as a foreign nobleman. Vampires are inhuman monsters, and few portrayals truly capture and understand that as well as Shrek's. Even his death is perfect. He's not hunted down and outsmarted by some human doctor. His hunger and bloodlust doom him as he lingers on the lovely neck of Hutter's wife for too long, leaving him the ultimate victim of his appetites. Number three, the special effects. Murnau really treats us to some razzle-dazzle here. Whether it's the horse cart moving at a natural speed, Orlok sitting perfectly upright, the telekinetic powers moving doors and coffins, or Orlok's fade out at the end, Murnau pushed the limits of technology and imagination with this film. Orlok seems supernatural, and never more than when he's breaking all the rules of what characters can do in film, he does more. And he does it amazingly. This film needed magic. We got it. And then some. The cons, number one, the color tinting. The oranges, the yellows, the blues, just yuck. In a film that's so beautifully composed shot for shot, the trickiness offered by the color tinting is just terrible. It's distracting in the worst kind of way. I would love to see this whole film in glorious simple black and white where everything could shine but with the constant color tinting i found too many times i'm asking myself why is it yellow right now and i'm not sure a hundred years later i don't know if that's something the director intended number two the, the reimagination of the renfield character through knock in the novel and most familiar versions of Dracula, Renfield is the one who has been condemned to an asylum having had his sanity utterly destroyed, somehow, by the Count. In a bit of odd lawsuit-avoiding trickery, Nock is established first as a sane character who then goes insane, and the problem is when that happens and he starts muttering about blood and eating flies, there's really no narrative reason for it. It's like they wanted to include the scene from the book, but by condemning Nock this way, you get a bit of a WTF for the audience. It's just this kind of subtle, bad narrative change that happens sometimes when source material is adapted, especially for the sake of change. In this case, they want to avoid a lawsuit, so perhaps it's understandable, but regardless, the reimagination of the character was a failure. Number three, Ellen. From her weird, expressionless face to her annoying tippy-toe walking to the fact that she somehow gets ensorcelled by Orlok without them ever having met, just her performance and how her character gets across. If this is Murnau's version of Mina Harker, well, I dare say, you, madam... Or no Mina Harker. Nosferatu occupies a special place in film history. It's the movie that we all need to see, that we all need to accept as the beginning of great on-screen vampirism. But it's the one we almost didn't get. To think that it could have been destroyed through the results of a lawsuit decades before many of us were born, we dodged one there, folks. And we're lucky that this film is still there, able to be enjoyed, able to be appreciated, able to be cherished for its role in cinematic history. It's a masterpiece, a truly special piece of filmmaking that everyone should watch at least once. Of course, it gets a watch recommendation from me. You're up. Okay, so my pros. One, the sets. They were really cool. The homes and buildings were big and really pretty. And Count Orlok's castle is amazing. Plus, you can really see the German expressionism in the sets, with all the angles and shadows, similar to what we saw in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. It made the film very interesting to watch. 2. Hutter. This guy is so funny. He's like the most laid-back, oblivious guy ever. It's a silent film, so we can only tell what he says through the intertitles, but for most of the movie, whenever something bad or weird happens, he just shrugs it off like everything's fine. When we watch the movie, we like to joke that he always says, preposterous. Sort of like, oh, this sketchy guy seems to be obsessed with my wife, and I woke up with two wounds on my neck. 
Is something going on? Preposterous. It's clearly just mosquitoes. His reactions are so funny. I love watching him. Three. The scene on the boat. Can you guess which one I'm talking about? Because I'm not saying a scene on the boat. I'm saying the scene on the boat. Of course, I mean the one where Count Orlock gets out of his coffin with a straight back, not moving, and just sort of levitating out. It's one of my favorite parts in the entire movie. It's just so creepy and cool when it happens. I get goosebumps every time. Now my cons. One. The colors. I was not a fan. The color tinting just did not look good, and it didn't really fit with the feel of the film either. I especially didn't like how different colors were used for different scenes. If the film was just in black and white, it would have been so much better, but the tinting really took me out of the moment and made me feel more disconnected from the story. 2. Count Orlock being overpowered. This was just ridiculous. Like, I get it, he's a supernatural being, so he's gotta have some sort of powers, but it was just a bit much. He had never even met Nock before, and yet he already had him under mind control? Plus, he had some wicked telekinesis going on. It just felt like he was so strong and powerful that if he had never made the stupid mistake and stayed drinking Ellen's blood until daylight and got himself killed, Hutter and the others wouldn't have stood a chance at defeating him. And that's all I have. Actually, I do have one more thing to say, but it's less of a pro or con and more of an observation. Okay, so Nock, the sketchy estate broker, right? And you know Bilbo Baggins, right? Okay, so remember in Fellowship of the Ring when they're all in Rivendell and Bilbo goes all crazy for a second and tries to take the ring from Frodo and looks super creepy? Well, that's immediately what I thought of when I saw Nock. They totally have the same vibe. Now, in case you couldn't tell, I love this movie. I've loved it since the first time I saw it, and I've been a fan of Nosferatu for even longer. Specifically, ever since that one Halloween episode of Spongebob where Nosferatu is just chilling in a closet. Yes, absolutely, you should watch this movie. Okay. So once again, that brings us to the end of another episode. And to no one's surprise, it is a double watch recommendation from us for Nosferatu. <laughs> Have you seen this film? If not, why not? There will never be a better time. And be sure to tell us what you think about it. Next week, we'll be looking at things from a slightly more lighthearted perspective. We'll be looking at a film that celebrates the tradition of the universal horror monsters while spoofing it in the best of ways, and perhaps turning in one of the greatest monster films of all time. That's because we're going to be having a look at Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. This is absolutely one of my favorites, and I can't wait to watch it again and talk about it on the show. So join us in two weeks for that. But in the meantime, be sure to watch more movies. And tell everyone all about us. We are not a secret, and you don't have to keep us all to yourselves. So tell your friends. Tell your enemies. You never know. They might like mistaking vampire attacks for illness plagues as much as you do. Maybe even more. For Sam the Sidekick, I'm Derek, and I love old movies. Additional research for I Love Old Movies, the podcast, is done by Nikki Weatherden. Audio clips come from freefx.co.uk. Images are used through the provisions of fair use, and our theme song, Burning Bridges, is by The Crocs.